This is the Aurelius Podcast, episode 55 with Donna Spencer. I'm Zach Naylor, co-founder at Aurelius and your host for the podcast, where we discuss all things UX, research, and product. In this episode, we have Donna Spencer. She's been doing UX for 20 plus years, before we were even calling it user experience design. Donna has a new book out where she talks about presenting design work, as well as many other writings in her past. Donna and I talked about her new book and how to present design work, where she shares some tips on how to do that effectively for both designers and researchers. Additionally, we had an awesome chat about where the field of UX is, how the industry has changed, and Donna's observations on where we've been and where we're going next. She has a ton of experience in the field as a practitioner, coach, and writer. You don't want to miss this one. Not to mention, it was just a flat-out fun conversation. This podcast is brought to you by Aurelius, the powerful research repository and insights platform. Aurelius is an all-in-one space for researchers to organize and analyze data, capture insights, and share outcomes with your team. Transcribe audio, visualize themes, capture findings, and have a report created for you automatically, which you can share with anyone in moments. Check us out at AureliusLab.com. That's A-U-R-E-L-I-U-S-L-A-B.com. Okay, let's get to it. Hey, Zach, how are you? I'm just fine. How about yourself? Pretty good. Yeah. We were you know, there's a bit this. of a reservation in there. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. We were talking about that a little bit just before we started recording here that seems things have uh, spiked a little bit where you're from. And so just managing that, huh? Yeah. Yeah. And it's eight o'clock in the morning and I've had a half a coffee. But, so pretty good is a, is a solid good, really. <laughs> yeah. Pretty good. Being a solid good is definitely one we'll take. <laughs> we'll definitely take that to do this. And we do, and certainly appreciate you jumping on, taking the time to chat. I'm excited to do so. And I've been following your work for a little while, and I know you have some some new writings and things like that, too, looking to chat with you about all of that. But even before we do, maybe for folks listening, if maybe aren't already familiar with your work and who you are, could you give some background, introduce yourself? Of course. So my name's Donna Spencer. These are things that sometimes I forget to do, like actually tell people my whole name. <laughs> um, I am just as much known as Madonna with two A's. One day, the other Madonna will answer me on social media and it will be amazing, but still hasn't happened. That's where I can be found pretty easily. Still, I'm not sure how to describe myself, but I've been doing user experience design things for 20 odd years. So before we were really calling it user experience design. And I say it loosely like that because I tend to go through chunks where I do like different stuff for a year. So the last year I've been head down in the weeds with a really complex classification doing information architecture work. A year before that, I spent a year basically facilitating design thinking workshops over and over. A year before that, I was helping teams learn how to do agile. So I do these things in chunks and it's really good because I like variety and I like that changeableness, but it makes it hard for me to pigeonhole myself and it makes it exceptionally hard for people to figure out what they should hire me for. That's totally fair. Actually, I love that. It it, it sounds a lot like how I sort of bounced around in that before I landed on what we do now and sort of yeah. starting Aurelius. But yeah, I mean, very much was like, I do front end and visual design and then I do interaction design and then now I do research and strategy yeah. and workshops. Yeah. And- Actually, now I'm doing product management <laughs> yeah. and it comes just like full spectrum, right? <laughs> uh, it keeps things interesting. Uh, of course, I also managed, uh, you know, and ran a, a conference for nine years in there as well. Right. Just, oh, and now I'm learning millinery just for good measure as well, like <laughs> Mil- hat making. Oh, okay. Okay. I was some person <laughs> with those millinery. Interesting. All right. Yeah. It's awesome. Just, just for some variety. That is something I know nothing about. So I'm I, not I know, able to- I know little, but I have some, I have some nice new hats. That's awesome. <laughs> That's so awesome <laughs> that you can make your new your own new hats now. One of the things that I want to ask you, because you've been doing this for a while, is just with somebody with so much experience, how have you seen the industry really change? And what's your kind of impression of where we are today and what UX really means? I've seen it change dramatically. And of course, a period of 20 odd years, you're going to see it change anyway. But when I started in it, we were mostly kind of usability people. We would do usability testing and kind of make tweaks. And design as a thing wasn't necessarily, I mean, clearly people were designing stuff. It always happened, but we had that kind of focus. And then early through, early in my career, we were, a lot of us were focused on information architecture and then the kind of start of user experience design. And then design exploded, I think, the design thinking and the double diamond and shorter 
sharper design, everybody can do design kind of approaches. And that happened. And now what I'm seeing is something that doesn't even look like the industry that I used to work in. In that, and I'm not quite sure the causes, but in that I see more UX UI than anything with it being primarily UI and that primarily being let's design every screen at high fidelity slow. And when I see this happening in a team I'm working with or whatever, I'm like, ah, is that how we do it? How did you think about like the structure of this thing? How does it hang together? When did you do your like content analysis or data analysis? How does this relate to that? How do you understand what actually can go on a page? And a lot of designers that I'm working with, I don't want to say this negative, but it's a fact, are like, oh, I don't know. And what they do is string high fidelity screens in a row without necessarily understanding like a bigger picture. And I think some of this is triggered by working agile because in working in short periods, you're like, okay, what can we do? We'll do these screens. What can we do next? We'll do these screens. We'll do this flow. And some of it is boot camp style training that focuses on what can be taught. And you can teach people how to string screens together in a flow. And some of it is like feature-driven product development. So we're we're going to make this feature now next couple of sprints. And the thing that I'm seeing missing is an underpinning thinking about like concepts as a whole, like a system as a set of data and interactions and user behaviors that mush together into something that works. That most of the stuff I work on is fairly complex. So I completely understand this approach if you're doing that with a couple of screens. But when you then try to dive into something where the data is complex or the user behaviours need to be unpicked or you've got really novice users. I just don't think this works super well. I think I I kept seeing designers really tripping over their feet in expanding beyond the initial set of screens that they've done. And I ponder a lot on why it is like it is and is that okay and am I just being a grumpy old lady or did we really lose something? (laughs) There definitely is some of the I can be a grumpy old lady in there. (laughs) That's that's, uh, totally fair. But actually, you started going into that. And I was going to ask, why? I mean, why do you feel like you've seen this? I would agree, for what it's worth, that I've seen a a heavy focus on sort of the the spit and polish of design and almost an industrialization of that. I've referred to that term before, where there's a lot of tools and a lot of processes that kind of, and just technology that came up that allowed that to happen faster. Yeah, actually tooling helped it happen. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I too asked, myself why and I don't know that I I have a a great answer to that but I'll ask you (laughs) I mean why do you think that's the case well I think it's the case for a bunch of those reasons like well the increase in presence and prominence in of design in projects as well like we spent a long time saying designers need to be more involved and then companies hired them okay what do we do with all these people okay they can do screens so I think there's a bunch of reasons the thing I ponder more is does it matter does it matter is it okay if but is it, is it okay if this is how we design? Just because it isn't how I used to design? I Like I, I would have and still do design in a much more kind of abstract way where I might design, I certainly design in wireframe form, not in high fidelity form until it needs to be done. But I'm much more likely to say, okay, I need this kind of thing. I need this kind of template and this template will work in these situations And in this situation, it does that. And in that situation, it does that. And when these things interact with each other, it does these things. So a much more kind of abstract and rules-based way is how I design. And I'm always thinking about whether whether that's okay. (laughs) I do worry about landing in a client who expects me to just churn out the screens and flows though. But luckily, I haven't (laughs) been caught in that one. Yeah, I would agree. That's a very wise question to ask. Does it matter? Rather than yeah. trying to figure out why it is the case, does it matter? Because yeah. because it's interesting. I think there's a lot of people who would probably say, well, it's getting done as well as it used to be. I, I don't know if that's true or not. I would actually be really curious to hear your opinion on that. But uh, In my experience, and of course, this is only on projects that I've seen worked with, been around, I don't think it is getting done as well as it could be. I have witnessed projects that I think could have been done a lot quicker with fewer design resources. And I've witnessed things that need to be redone because without 
starting at without starting closer to the beginning and like thinking through the the big ball of mess we're dealing with you get part way along and then you realize that your lego doesn't fit together and oh god i had a third, third good idea oh i've witnessed and this is this maybe always happened folks popping things on screens and stakeholders getting very excited about those things on screens and the concepts etc and then and then they realize that it's impossible like that the data doesn't exist or the data can't exist, or it doesn't have the relationships built into it to work that way, or there's like just other super, super crazily complex things that mean that the sketches and amazing concepts that came through something like a workshop or or some good idea generation can't be done. So I think there are consequences in that you've shown something to stakeholders and they're like, that's amazing. We would love that. That'd be great. And then you have to go back later and say, oh, sorry, it was impossible. So this is my information architecture kind of head always uh, talking at me. I cannot ever start something until I understand the content or data I'm working with and how it relates and what it has and what its categories are and how it's clustered and what's naturally good about it and what isn't. Only then can I go, okay, cool. I can now start putting some concepts together because I'm always really grounded in this is doable. And of you know, that might be a, a failing in itself in that I'm always grounded and really practical and other people are like, well, let's not, let's like try to actually bust out of that. But that's my bias is I want to do things that actually can be done. And it probably limits my, my creativity a bit, but I probably also deliver. <laughs> that's awesome. That's a really awesome answer. It, it's, it made me think about the, another response to that is perhaps, well, we're able to do high fidelity designs faster. So we're actually able to make those changes faster. And so the cost is lower. And that's fair. I think true yeah. and fair. But on the flip side of what, definitely what I'm taking away from what you said is absolutely the case of where you put this in front of somebody and there were a certain set of expectations laid out. And then changing yeah. that, however easy, doesn't actually matter as much because there were expectations that this was the thing. It looked a lot more finished than perhaps it was. And maybe some of where you didn't say this directly, but I'm pulling this out. Some of the, some of what we showed you maybe was at a place where we didn't fully understand the problem to be solved. Yeah. And we solved a problem that was cool, <laughs> but it wasn't yeah. the right one. Yeah. Or it wasn't, or a solution that will solve the right problem, but is actually just impossible because data doesn't exist or content doesn't exist, whatever kind of style of stuff you're working on that's underpinning it, that still has to be there. You still have to be able to generate the things that go into driving a system. So sometimes a, a great concept solves a, a real problem, but then people start saying, okay, so where does the data come from? How are we going to build that? What are the business rules around it? And we'll start going, oh, I don't know. I thought the data people would do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not, if you've got a fully polished design and you're asking that question, you're probably dug yourself into a trench somehow. Yep. My, the current folks I'm working with don't listen to this and think, oh, she's talking about us. I'm talking about it, having seen it across a bunch of projects, I reckon probably for easily five years, every, everything I've done in the last five years, I've seen this on. So I'm not having a dig at anybody who I am currently working with. <laughs> <laughs> very, very uh, well done dis disclaimer there. So, you know, a lot of this, I think very much kind of falls in line into some of your recent writings and particularly one of the, uh, or I think perhaps your most recent book, Presenting Design Work, right? And so mm -hmm. maybe talk a little bit about that. I have to suspect that just all of the experience you've got in doing this led you to say, I think we need a book that talks about this in a different way. Right. So maybe talk a little bit about how you came up with that idea and, uh, and the sh a general overview of that book. Yeah. Uh, the reason I wrote that little book, and the, uh, so I've got another one um, in production at the moment called Facilitating Design Thinking Workshops. And I'll talk about them together in that kind of where did they come from. I was, I had a gap in between quitting a job and figuring out what I did next. I'm like, what should I do with myself? I'm like, I know a lot of stuff. I have a lot of experience doing things and I'm good at some stuff. What am I good at? And I'm like, I'm good at presenting. I'm really good at facilitating. I'm really good at wrangling groups. And I'm good at all kinds of other things as well, but some of those I've written down. And I was trying to think about what I'm good at that is probably under addressed and needed. And that's where both of these things came from. And luckily, like both are super skinny books. They're like 10,000 words. So they were you know, like 10,000 words to me is 
pretty achievable pretty easily. And what needed to happen in both cases was I needed to unpick what I did that made me good at these things fairly naturally without both like presenting and facilitating the things that I do without training. Like I don't do them very deliberately. I am a natural at it. I have been my, my my parents made me do a Stedford. I don't know if a Stedford is a known thing, but a Stedford is like you get on stage and you do stuff. You do like poetry and little plays and things. So they made me do a Stedford when I was like six to 12 because I was super shy. But it means that I've been on stage in front of people since I was six. I still had a very super shy period through my teens. So in both cases, I wanted to unpick what I did that I knew I did well and do it in a way that wasn't, I hate just really shallow, trivial kind of work. I hate stuff that just seems like self-help and normal. So I really want to see what my difference was. And in the presenting design work, what I really focused on was something that I learned in a workshop from Mike Montero uh, and something that I'd never seen until I did this workshop with Mike, which was how do you teach your stakeholders to give good feedback? Because mostly your stakeholders have never done this thing before. They've never worked on a tech project. They don't know how to interpret design. They don't know what to say when you say to them, what do you think? They don't have a structure for that. So I started from that. How do we teach? And I've always done this well, and I do it well because I probably empathise and work with my stakeholders better than I do user-based empathy. I really do care to listen, to understand like where they're coming from or what their previous experiences are and what they have to add to the whole design process in a way that makes them not feel stupid. And some of this like probably also has leaked into my head from Kathy Sierra's old work around making your users rock. I don't make my stakeholders, I don't make them feel like they're able to add value to this thing that affects them. And so then also like in thinking about the writing about facilitation, I took that same approach and so I thought I'd talk to you about them together. And in that, I spent a lot of time kind of thinking about and writing about. So you're in this situation, you're in a room with a bunch of people. Again, they're often your stakeholders and users and customers. You've got a mixed group of people in a in a design thinking workshop. And most of them have never done anything like this before. And you want to use their time, you want to use their expertise. That's why you put them there. It's not meant to be just like to make you look better or to pretend that you had a, an activity. You're meant to be using their input. So how do we get them from the beginning of that workshop activity to the end and use their skills right throughout in a way that they go, I rock at this. I'm amazing. I need a drawing. I had an idea. That was super cool. I feel good about myself. And so that they don't feel like, oh, crap, the facilitator just asked me to sketch. I can't draw and close down, which is what I see a lot. And so similarly with presenting design work, it's about making sure that when you're presenting to people, you say, okay, I know who you are and I know what your expertise is in this room. So I know why you're here. And today I'm going to show you a thing. And I want you to focus on this and I want you to focus on that and I want you to check if I've done the right things here and really get people to understand what their expertise is in that process and lend that expertise and then, and then show them through something and then ask them questions related to what they already know. So does this work for our current customers? Is this technically feasible? And not just, so what do you think? Do you like it? Because if you ask, what do you think and do you like it? You're going to get random answers that people feel like they must contribute because surely they're in the room for a reason. And that's where you get the, oh, I think the button should be a bit bigger. Can you change that shape of blue, color of blue? <laughs> blue can be a shape as far as I'm concerned. Oh, absolutely. It certainly is a shape in my head. <laughs> <laughs> No, this is fantastic. This is fantastic stuff, particularly that last part. One of the things that I have told people as well is if you ask somebody a question, you're going to get an answer. <laughs> so if you ask, what do you think? They're going to tell you what they think. And to yeah. your point, again, I'm just distilling it down what you're saying and trying to dish it back is they're going to answer based on the level of expertise they have. And it's not their job yeah. to know how to give great design feedback. It's not their job yeah. to be able to speak our language. It's you know, sort of the reverse. There were some really good things that I pulled out of what you were saying. I love that you went back to Kathy Sierra and uh, making stakeholders rock, making users rock. I really need to reread her stuff. She's amazing. Yeah. So, I mean, that's really great too. And the point that you made off of that that stuck with me is with stakeholders in presenting with them and getting feedback from them, 
really the point of using them and their skills and experience as an advantage to your process. Not You don't look at this as a speed bump. I think a lot of people, designers, researchers, whoever it might be presenting their work, they look at this as a speed bump. They look at it as as a challenge. They they clam up. It's something that they just have to do and get out of the way. What you're really saying is use this as an opportunity. This can enrich your work. And I love that. I think that's absolutely true. Well, it it not only can, it should enrich your work. Like those people have, I feel my my job as a designer is not to be any kind of rock star designer and say, ta-da, look what I came up with. My job is to get all the best brains available to contribute to making something together and I happen to be the person who knows how to bridge between all those good brains and the technology or bridge between those good brains and the data or bridge between those good brains and the users. I know how to do that but it's, and it's usually not my product, it's somebody else's. It's their thing. So they should be contributing a lot. And I'm just doing a translation job. Beautifully said. I love analogies. It's no secret. I use them all the time on our <laughs> show. I use them all the time when talking with people. And the one that just popped in the head and to my head is based off of what you said is almost made me think of a conductor. Yes. With a symphony. You're not necessarily the one that has to be great at playing the violin or the cello or mm. percussion, but you are absolutely the person that say, can say, here's the folks that we ought to have playing these instruments. Yep. Here's the tune that we can play, and I can help coordinate that to put on a beautiful show. Yeah, that's a great analogy. I'm not terribly good at analogies, but that one works <laughs> super well. Well, I yep. love analogies. It's like my yep. favorite thing. And that's part of what, <laughs> that's, that's absolutely my job on this, is to very much like yep. you said, uh, not be the expert on this, but rather bring folks like yourself and try to translate that back out to folks who are listening and hopefully yep. add some value that way. So I'm glad to hear that I, that I got that one on the money. Yeah, and to ask all the questions, to say, So tell me, violin player, how does this work? Like, how does your stuff contribute? How, like, what's the kind of technology and data and content and concepts here? Explain that. Yeah, absolutely. doesn't work quite so well in violin, but. Absolutely. Well, so so getting back to the book and what you wrote Mm -hmm. there, if somebody were to to come up and just say, all right, give me the 40,000 foot view. What okay. is that book all about? How would you answer them? 40,000 foot, foot view is it's a teeny weeny practical book that you can read fast and walk away ready to be better at presentations. It focuses, like I said a moment ago, on helping stakeholders understand how to give good feedback. And one of the key points in it is to not present your process, but to present the thing you came up with so that the people on the other side understand what you're recommending because they don't really care about what you did in between. 40,000, I'm really deep. I'm really practical. 40,000 feet views are hard for me. (laughs) That's okay. That's okay because you did some extra credit and I was going to ask you that anyway. So you already answered (laughs) the next question I was going to ask. And I just have to comment on that too, because that is so important for work that I've done and how I've spoken to people as well. But particularly as sort of where I am now too, I mean, and the more of the research strategy end of things, but Mm -hmm. but now actually running a company, I could not agree more. And I tell people this, especially newer to the field, nobody cares about your process. They don't care about the tools you used. They don't actually care about any of that. They want, specifically speaking of, let's say, when you're presenting research, the thing I've always told people is they want an answer to their question. Yeah. (laughs) Right now there are going to be people, and this is great, actually. It's a good sign when people are... When, when they question how you got there or they question yeah. the data that backs up that answer to the question and be prepared for that. Yeah. But spend your time and energy on getting the answer to the question and helping tell yeah. that story really well. Yeah. I'm always going to ask a researcher what their methodology was because when they present that information, it comes out of a context. And if they then tell me like a methodology and I'm like, yeah, well, you, of course you got that answer because your methodology was like led to it. Yeah, I don't want to hear that up front. I don't want a I don't want to read an academic paper. I want to hear what they did and what came out of it and what was cool and what's really interesting. And then when I ask, or as a you know, backup, by the way, this is how we collected this and therefore we know that it's valid. Yeah, and the same goes with presenting your designs. Our stakeholders all want to understand what we came up with. And if they have questions about how you got there. Or did you try other things? They will ask them, but they're better to ask them in the context of what 
you came up with or what your final kind of recommendation, solution, sketches, whatever are, because then that makes sense to them. If you run through your process, like I did this and then I did that and then we did some other stuff and that didn't work and then we tried this and this is what we landed on, You've by the time you get to the point, they're lost. Now, hang on, which thing are you showing me? So, yeah, yeah. give them the answer. Yeah, yeah. And then explain anything that needs to be explained around it. It's actually a principle in just uh, good writing and storytelling, I think, in general. Yeah. And yeah. one of the is, is a really great story that I have to share because we're talking about this from the journalist Nora Ephron. And so mm-hmm. she recounts in her high school journalism class, the teacher was trying to teach a lesson and make a point and said, I, I want everybody to sort of write the lead of mm-hmm. this article and I'm going to dictate the facts to you because that's typically how journalism works, right? And so the teacher goes on to talk about all these things saying, okay, so next Thursday, such and such high school is going to send all of its teachers to this symposium to learn new teaching methods. It's going to discuss this and this. And so he goes on for about a paragraph describing this stuff, right? And she describes this, the setting of everybody in the class sort of writing down all these facts and collecting these things and turning the papers in. And everybody, of course, is essentially just regurgitating the facts. Yeah. And he he takes them all and basically sets them in the trash and he goes, the lead of the story is not those facts. The lead is there will be no school next Thursday. Of course. Right? (laughs) And that, it's a funny example. It's absolutely a funny story. But how well delivered is the point there? Yeah. Where people don't need to hear you repeat the thing I just told you. They want to know what's Mm. the point. Yeah. The best like crime novels and TV shows show you what happened first. And then you watch the investigators figure it out. They show you some of what happened. Like you, they don't just go, investigators sitting at their desk, here's, they have a phone call, they go out and learn stuff. You always know something that they don't. You know the answer. And then everything else that they learn and all the red herrings are in context of that. And you can tie it all together. And we're doing the same. Here's the answer. It's not a crime novel. We're not trying to figure out what happened. Here's the answer. Now I can tell you about all the red herrings that I went through if I need to. Yeah. You care about the answer to that. You care about the ending. Yeah. And if you've become invested in that, there are times when people say, well, how did you arrive at that? Or is there anything on the periphery you can learn more about, dig into and understand how we arrived at that place? Yeah. And often the stakeholders will say, why didn't you do it like such and such? Or did you think about such and such? And you can tell them the answer then. You can say, yeah, I did do that. I tried it. The reason it didn't work is this and this. Or yes, that I, we, I did go through that process. I did think about those things and the reason it's not here is because. But if you start telling them that, it's like saying, I'm going to tell you that I ignored your stuff straight away rather than here's what we did. And yes, I did actually pay a lot of attention to your stuff. Yeah, totally. So in discussing all of this, it makes me think of the question then in presenting design work. I mean, do the principles you have in that book apply to people who are presenting research work as well? Or would you have perhaps different advice for people who are presenting findings from research? Yeah, look, I think that people presenting research can read the book and get a lot out of it in the, there's five points in the book. Um, They can certainly get a lot out of the part where I tell them to understand who's in the room and to get people to give deliberate feedback on their expertise. And they certainly can get some good stuff out of understanding how to teach stakeholders to give feedback. The part that doesn't relate to research is like, uh, I I guess as long as they can stretch their analogy to showing the result before you show the process. But the other point that I cover in the book is, is show a person doing a thing, not do a real estate tour. Because designers often will say, Here's a screen, there's the logo, here's some navigation, there's some filter, there's some, there's a carousel, there's a button. And instead of that, I suggest that designers say, so this is the example from the book. Norton wants to buy clothing for his three-year-old who is growing very fast. He likes buying clothing from secondhand shops. He wants to find out if there are clothing stores, secondhand clothing stores in his area that have children's clothes and that might also buy clothes. He goes to this thing that he knows about for some reason. This thing exists. He checks close by him because he'd like to walk. He finds a place that has children's clothing and will buy children's clothing and decides to go there next week. He also checks if it has parking in case he wants to drive. So there's a story. And then what I say is do that again. So tell the story once, showing the screens as you go backwards and tell the story again. 
because the first pass, people are trying to take all that in. They're trying to understand Norton and his three-year-old and what's on the screen, and it's really fast. And I think there's a, a cognitive principle I don't know the name of, but the first time you do something, it seems really slow, and the second time you do it, it's really quick. So you go over and do it again. You might change the details a bit so you don't feel like you're exactly repeating yourself. But the second time stakeholders can go, okay, I've got the story in my head. I can start watching out for bits and pieces. And then you do use that approach for anything you're showing. And if you need, this, I mean, this is still similar to show the answer and then dig into details. If then you need to go talk about a filter and the categories in the filter or exactly how the map works and how you would set your radius, you can do that after. Again, you're talking about it in context. I think that I haven't quite found a bridge to that and research work, but the rest of the book, without that chapter, I didn't write it deliberately for researchers and I didn't try to shoehorn two things into one. I was being very careful to say this is one thing, it's one skinny thing, and it's on point and it doesn't try to be anything else. But, yeah, there's definitely, I mean, I hope, that there's good advice there generally, and researchers do other things as well. Yeah, for sure. Well, based on what you've uh, just shared with us here, I mean, that certainly tracks for me. And so yeah. I think that's applicable without question. But also made me think of something uh, I personally learned from Edward Tufte a long time mm -hmm. ago, and very well known, of course, for his book on uh, books on data visualizations, but also yeah. uh, world renowned for how, how excellent of a presenter he's been. And he talks about this. And one of his principles, I believe it was him. And so if I'm misappropriating this, I apologize. But uh, I heard it from him. And he said, well, you know, when you start a presentation, tell people what you're going to tell them. Yeah. Tell them that thing. And then remind them that you told them that thing. And it was, as you were describing that, that makes, that makes perfect sense. It's not, it might seem repetitive, but for maximum retention of this stuff, yeah. especially when it's new. You can't when expect that they're going to know everything that you've shared with them, that it took you two weeks to come up with that story and everything that backs yeah. it up and all the work that went into it, right? Yeah. Yeah, you really need like an overview. There's the story and then go back and look at it again because otherwise it's too much stuff too fast. Like just watching any kind of presentation is too quick. That's why it's nice watching movies at home. You can go, hang on, what happened there? <laughs> <laughs> well, now we can, right? Back in the day, that was a, little, that was a lot harder. We either had to go and rewatch the whole thing or we had to hope we had it taped <laughs> in a VCR for, oh my goodness, I can imagine there's people uh, listening to this going, I've never operated a VCR before and I don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that I want to ask too, you know, in writing the book and as you think about doing this work, what's the one big gotcha in presenting design work? What's the one thing you would maybe, you know, give somebody advice on to say, avoid this at all costs? It is not about you. That's fantastic advice. You know, <laughs> honestly, it is. It, First it seems, time I've given a short answer ever. It seems like such a simple thing, but let that marinate for a bit and unpack it. And it's that's such a huge deal. And we recently had Vivian Castillo on the show. Oh, yeah. And uh, one of the things that she said, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to try to quote this exactly. She said something to the effect of one of the biggest occupational hazards in UX is ego. Absolutely. And it, it's so true. As soon as you hear somebody yeah. say that, it's just... I mean, the impact that has, I think that you, everybody, it doesn't matter how sort of objective you think or imagine yourself to be, take that into consideration. And uh, as yeah. you said, it's not about you. Yeah. Yeah. I really think, uh, you know, Kathy Sierra was writing this stuff a fair while ago. I really think a lot of that landed in my head right at the right time as a designer, really to think about making other people rock, like really to make other people shine and be amazing. I think it was a good time for me to land in my head. Otherwise, I, I certainly have some ego. <laughs> I certainly think I'm pretty good at some stuff, but I very much try to make it about other people. Yeah, and I'm game mastering a Dungeons and Dragons game at the moment. And it's super fun because I get to make other people rock. I get them yeah. to make their stories. I get them to figure out how they're going to react. And I just nudge them along a path. And it's so fun not, <laughs> me, not being about me. Yeah. Well, I think that's fine, right? Like, I think everybody is going to have a certain amount of ego. But uh, the real catch, the fine line you walk, is being aware of that and acknowledging that or not. And, and just being, or as opposed to maybe saying, I have no ego. It's, uh, it's not this, it's <laughs> about the design as well. I actually almost think that's the antithesis. I think you probably have more ego than they yeah. imagine. And that can be dangerous as uh, both you and Vivienne and other guests have said. <laughs> so I have masses of ego. Yeah. I just have learned not to go, don't you know who I am? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that would be, <laughs> oh man. I mean, cause that's, it's very true. It's this, 
And I think I have seen us come out of this a bit as an industry, <laughs> but there was absolutely a period of this idea of a hero designer or this chief design officer that's just going to have all the yeah. answers. This would have been like a, a former like Johnny Ive type person yeah. that if we just bring that on our organization, we're going to get all these things solved. And that's not the case. I mean, even you have said it yourself earlier all. in our conversation. The job is not to have the answers for this stuff, but rather to sort of orchestrate those people mm. to find and act on those answers together. Yeah. Awesome. Yep. Awesome. <laughs> well, we are coming up to the end of our time, and I have to be respectful of that for you, especially since you're starting your day and you have other things to get to, I'm quite sure. One of I the have a large that... spreadsheet waiting for me. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't want to I don't want to hold you back from that. Made a data piece of data analysis. Yep. Well, that actually is interesting. <laughs> If it's, I thought it was maybe just a, a regular boring spreadsheet. No, a really hard piece of data analysis so that we can figure out what we can actually put into a system. Yeah, fantastic. So I'm way <laughs> into that. I'm way into that for obvious reasons. <laughs> but one of the things that I do on every episode is mm-hmm. I say, if somebody hit me on the head and I have temporary amnesia, and then mm-hmm. it came up to you and said, well, what did you talk about? What was that podcast about? How would you answer that and summarize it for folks? We talked about respecting the people you work with and their excellent, amazing skills and knowledge and being an orchestrator, not a hero. Awesome. You gave another short answer. That was a great summary and essentially one sentence. So awesome. So is there anything that you want to share with folks that we didn't get a chance to talk about and cover today? Um, 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 um. Oh, I tell you what I should also share with folks. So a while ago, I wrote a book on information architecture and recently my distributor decided that they didn't want to distribute it anymore with no notice and took it off their website. So I put it on my website for free until I rewrite it. That was a couple of months ago. So right now there is a practical guide to information architecture for free. Sometimes then people say, oh, that was amazing. How can I throw you a couple of dollars? Uh, And I say, buy one of my other books. So if if Ah. you want, you can have practical guide to information architecture for free and then go buy the presenting design book. It's only it's not very much. I can't remember how much. It's skinny and cheap. So you, you may have two for one. Awesome. Well, we're going to have links to that stuff in the yeah, show Yeah, I'll send you a link. Yeah. And, we, and those are all on your site. So we can link to those and you'll be able to check yep. those out for folks listening to on our page where we've got this listed. Keep an eye out for that. That's awesome. And I believe I read that book way back when it came out. I'd have to double check. It may even be. That was a while ago. It's yeah. like 2010. Yeah, that sounds about right. It's still a really good book. That's why... Um, like, it's still really good. I, I wrote it just before mobile navigation, so it doesn't have any mobile stuff in it, but the foundational information architecture stuff in it is really good. And I do intend to rewrite it. I've got all the research done. I just need to buckle down and do some other things and then stick my head in, in, in a Word document. Well, I'm personally very excited about that because I don't <laughs> see a lot of people talking about IA really anymore, especially not to that depth. And I would, yeah. be very, I would be very curious to see what you come up with in rewriting it. I'll talk to you in a year. <laughs> okay, it's a deal. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay, well, Don, I really appreciate you taking the time. This was a fun chat, and I know that we could do a lot longer, but I don't want to stand in the way of your data analysis. And so, so we'll let you go, and I'll just simply say thank you again for just coming on and chatting with me. Great. Thank you very much for having me. This is a really good uh, and well-moderated orchestration of my random thoughts. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I appreciate you saying that. All right, everybody, we will see you next time. This podcast is brought to you by Aurelius, the research and insights tool that helps you analyze, search, and share all your research in one place so you can go from data to insights to action faster and easier. Check out Aurelius for yourself with a 30-day trial by going to AureliusLab.com. That's A-U-R-E-L-I-U-S-L-A-B.com. If you enjoyed this episode, it would mean a lot if you would give us a review on iTunes to let others know what you think. You can catch all new episodes of the Aurelius podcast almost anywhere you listen to podcasts like iTunes, Spotify, and more. Stay up to date when new episodes come out by signing up for our email updates on our website.